Hello everyone, my name is Tamor Hamid, and I'm going to be giving an introduction to structural Verilog. So, to understand Verilog or any HDL, you kind of need to uh, understand why they came about. Uh, this circuit right here is called is a full on is a full adder, and it's easy to represent using symbols and uh, can draw and stuff like this. But the problem you you run into is you want to represent it as text, so you can easily modify it, you can program it put it in another program if need be. And there are certain, uh, like certain things you still have to meet while keep, while representing the circuit uh, in its text form. First thing, we wanna be, since this is like a physical circuit, it's not limited by some central CPU running instruction at once. All these inputs trigger at the same time. It can be based off of a clock. Um, and you should essentially be able to turn it directly into hardware if need be. Uh, this is where hardware description language or HDLs come in, and they fill that exact role. They're a specialized notation to precisely and accurately describe a digital circuit. Uh, the most common ones you'll run into are Verilog and VHDL. Verilog also uh, has another version of itself called System Verilog, which has a couple of extra features um, that make it in some ways nicer to use, in some ways worse to use, but I'm not going to cover that in this. Um, one, what like the biggest part of HDLs is that since they describe hardware, physical hardware, they have to be implicitly par parallel. I will uh, cover this more in detail uh, in the next few minutes, but that is something very much to keep in mind. That's one of like the biggest, hardest learning curves when learning VHDL or Verilog is understanding that you want to treat like actual hardware and everything is happening at the same time, really. And if you take the FPGA course here, they're one of the biggest applications for them is programming an FPGA. FPGAs are massive in so, so many fields. I think comms people or cybersecurity track people definitely take an FPGA course. It, it comes in handy later. Uh, so Verilog is based off of C. It has similar syntax to it. Uh, that may not be apparent when if you're writing like structure Verilog, but it it's it is similar to C. It was initially designed, uh, developed by Gateway Design Automation in like the 80s, and was used mostly internally, but then they released it to the wild and all these different other engineering companies started to use it. The problem that developed is since each engineering company was using it, they added their own little things and had their own standardized version of Verilog that, was, that wasn't as compatible with other companies. And because of that, they realized they needed a central authority to define what Verilog was and what was it wasn't. That's where IEEE comes in. Uh, they defined Verilog to be a standard in 1995. And you can actually read the details about this standard, um, how it came about, and like what is specifically defined in this link. This is on their uh, website. Um, they've defined like so, so many standards, including floating point arithmetic, some Wi-Fi stuff, and Verilog def uh, like, as a standard is one of the big things that IEEE's done. Uh, but besides that, um, I named this slideshow Structural Verilog. That's sort of an unofficial way of splitting the two ways where Verilog is written. First way is Behavioral Verilog, the other way is, as I said, Structural Verilog. Uh, the differences between them are kind of just, like, uh, aren't rigidly defined. There's no official, like, nothing in the standards for Verilog itself says that, hey, this piece of code is structural, this piece is behavioral. It's just something that comes about. Uh, behavioral is more C-like. You're going to be using if statements, you can um, use case switch, stuff like that. But structural is kind of just defining gates and the links between them. Uh, it's more low level than the, like, defining logic for a circuit. I'm going to be focusing on structural since this uh, that's what's focused on in 2.12 and that's a lot easier to understand Verilog if you focus on the hardware aspects of it initially. Um, so since we're using, uh, we're going to talk about structural, the most important thing about structure is are the built-in primitives. Uh, primitives are the basic gates that uh, Verilog has. These include AND, OR, inverter, NMOS, PMOS, etc. All the basic stuff you run into. Uh, to use a primitive, you just call the primitive, uh, call the primitive, name it something, anything you want, and then outputs and then inputs. So if I wanted to have an AND, I would call it A1, then this would be the output signal, 
And these are the two input signals. It's very much like instantiating a struct or an object in C or C++. Um, and you can use it as such. I can have multiple AND gates. I can have one AND gate. And each one of them will be will have like the same logic as an AND gate should, but will, act, will function by themselves. Like, there's their own discrete things. Types. Uh, there's... Uh, since it's built off of C, there are integers, there are some floating stuff, but the main types that you want to run in, uh, you want to use are going to be wire and uh, reg. So wire is just like you would use a normal physical wire. It's an uh, you. It has to be continuously driven. Uh, it has to have a signal going through it, or it has to specifically not have a signal going through it, like a zero. Uh, it's, uh, it's used in assign statements. I'll cover that in a bit. Uh, they can be read. They can be uh, Given a value or read from, like to get the value from it, but you, they won't. They don't store a value by themselves. They have to be continuously driven, just like a normal wire. A normal wire doesn't have memory built into it. It's just a wire. Uh, you can connect two values to a wire, and that'll give it a weird unread value. Not that can come about error, or if you're doing something weird with it, it's gonna act just like any other wire would. There's also registers uh, or reg. Don't confuse this with uh, CPU registers. Um, just because you use a register variable, that's not does not mean that in your uh, synthesized design there's going to be a register there. That's register kind of just I'm not sure how the name came about, but they're just called that. They are much uh, they're like normal variables you'd have in Python or another language where you assign it a value and it stores that value until it's updated in the future. Um, if you're assigned two values to it. It's going to take the most recent one, uh, as opposed to a wire, where if you connect two things to it, it's going to go into a weird state where it doesn't really know which one to do. Uh, they should be used in initial or always blocks. I will get into that later. And they're almost exactly like a, vari uh, uh, a variable in another programming language. Both of them are defined like this. Uh, you have a type, uh, wire or reg, and then you just name it something. This is a little blurb from Stack Over posts I read detailing them. Uh, it seems a little if you're right now, but as I go through the slideshow, it'll become more and more clear. Uh, there's also vectors. So when you're making something that's going to have data running through it, you don't want to deal with one wire at a time. So you can have little clumps of uh, w wires and bits together to make vectors. Uh, here's a wire that is 8 bits long with the uh, MSB being 7 and the smaller, like the least important bit being 0. This you can have either one. So here I have like the MSB being zero. It just depends on which endian you're working. Just keep in mind that you don't mix them up. Uh, in terms of values, in terms of values, uh, registers and wires can have one, zero, high, low. Well, digital, it's all digital or an unknown state, that happens when you're doing something kind of funky, like connecting a wire to two things, or in high impedance state. This is used for tri-state buffers for something where something's gonna, if something's gonna act as an input pin and an output pin after one another. Uh, sign statements. So I mentioned before how wires have to be continuously driven. This is where assigned statements come in. Since wires don't store the, a value they have to be continuously driven and you assign it by signals so here i uh, have created a wire x and i'm setting its output to be the and of uh, y and z uh where like still allows logical operators you have and or a bitwise and or um shifting i don't know uh pluses minuses those type of things but you can this is called implicit assignment so x is always going to have continuously going to have uh, the and of y and x but there's also um, explicit assignment where i've declared a previously and i'm now assigning it to b and c both of these work um a register of the last type so using them don't use them with an assign they don't need to be continuously driven they shouldn't be driven continuously parallelism uh, as i mentioned before this is hardware at the end of the day and hardware isn't limited by a cpu running one instruction at a time if you if you give two inputs to a circuit, there's going to be power running through both of them. Uh, because of that, Verilog by default treats everything like parallel, unless you specifically define some things to not work in parallel. 
Uh, for example, if we have three counters, those three counters are not going to be skewed by each other unless you like design them to be. So they'll they'll keep time separately without worrying about like this timer run, runs uh, increments worse. Only then this timer can increment, and then this timer can increment. They can all increment at the same time. But that creates a problem. What if we do want to do something sequentially? That's where the procedural blocks come in. So uh, the initial block is one of the first types of procedure blocks. This executes at time equals zero. Just like its name, it sets the initial stuff that you want to run, defining default signals or um, whatever you want to set at the start. It's kind of like the main function. Uh, this is not synthesizable. I'll explain synthesizable and non-synthesizable in a bit. But just keep in mind that initial blocks aren't synthesizable at all. Uh, the FPGA itself isn't going to have like a special format of it that that synthesizes an initial block into something. Uh, the code for it is pretty simple. You just do initial begin and code. And unless, like, uh, besides initial blocks, you would use what are next called always blocks. These usually can work off of a clock pulse. So uh, these are synthesizable, where it'll wait for the first clock signal, run its code, then six one. And these can be used to sort of trigger off whatever's within these parentheses here. So post pause edge clock, neg edge clock, where it'll look at the positive edge of the signal, run the code in there, then it'll look at the look for or look for a neg edge of a signal and run the code in there. Uh, that makes it so you kind of have some you have control over when this runs rather than all, all running at the same time. Uh, just to make sure we're on the same uh, on like the same page for pause edge, neg edge. When a signal goes from zero to one, that's a pause edge, and when it goes from negative edge to one to zero, that's a that's a negative edge. Same thing with like a negative pulse. So synthesis and non-synthesis, uh, as mentioned, Verilog is an HDL. You kind of want if you're going to turn it into hardware, you want to make sure that code can be turned into hardware. So something like a delay statement, that's not a physical device. An FPGA isn't going to have a special part of it that defines the delay statement. Same thing with an initial block and some loops can be synthesizable, but they may not work as you expect in hardware. Um, but unsynthesizable code is still useful. Uh, you don't want to just write code and wait for a synthesize to test it out. You can write simulate uh, test benches, which let you simulate your code. And a lot of times, that's where you use the um, that's where you use the uh, the the initial blocks, the loops, and all the other stuff. So Verilog modules. Uh, previously, I showed primitives, which was the and, ors, and such, and they had certain inputs and certain outputs and function and work-like functions. That's what essentially modules would be. The modules are like they're functions you could make. Inside of them are uh, you can have them imp take a bunch of inputs, take a bunch of outputs, and then have code that takes the inputs and does something with them to output them, and you make a module out of that. It, it's just like a function in another language where you give it inputs, give it outputs, and such. Uh, except these are instantiable like objects. So if I make a module that, I don't know, uh, adds one to whatever input I give it and outputs something else, I could have multiple instantiations of that module. This is where you can develop like more complicated systems or more, more, more complicated designs based off of like simple basic modules because modules can exist within themselves so you can have like a sub module defined inside of a bigger sub a bigger module and that sort of helps you make better, more and more the cleaner code without having to redefine everything so now uh, i just have like a quick example that i made in verilog where uh, this is the circuit i showed you all initially uh, originally this is a full adder circuit got xors and an or carry in carry out i'm going to turn this into verilog so the way this works is this is my this is going to be my module for it. Uh, I took this example from Chip Verify, amazing website. If you have like any questions uh, in terms of Verilog and VHDL or System Verilog, uh, I got quite a bit of stuff for this slideshow off of there. But this mod, this full Latin module, um, I got the initial code, but I kind of modified it just so it'd be closer to this design here and a little bit more functional for the, like a bit more basic. Uh, initially you have outputs A and B. 
and uh, and carry in, and then you have an output sum and carry out. And I'm just defining a wire here, physical wire, like that's connected to this. And I'm just defining all these gates, all these different gates, and I'm connecting them using the wires and the outputs. So at the end, like this outputs the sum right there, and this carry out outputs the carry out signal. It's just a one-to-one -one translation from these gates directly into uh, text. So this is just the module, but how do you run it? That's where test benches come in. So as I mentioned before, test benches can be a little more uh, not as restrictive with their code. You can have unsynthesizable code in there because you're not going to synthesize a test bench usually. Uh, initially, I'm just defining a register A, B, uh, carry in, and wire, some carry out. Then I'm defining a counter and an integer. The integers are part of Verilog. I don't think they're synthesizable, however, but feel free to use them in um, simulation. So here I define a full ladder and I call it A. Then I set up the connections. So dot A is A. And this is how you should be typing, uh, entering the parameters. This is a better way of doing it than just having a uh, just typing in the parameters like anything else. I can have multiple of these full ladders if need be, but for this one, I just have one. Uh, then I have an initial block where I initially assign A and B and C uh, carry in as zeros, have a bunch of display statements. Uh, again, not synthesizable. These just are kind of like print in any other language. And then I have a monitor statement. Display statement is just going to print whatever you give it. A monitor statement is going to print but also it's going to keep track of these variables. So if any one of these variables change, it, uh, it will print itself again. And that's useful if you're repeatedly testing code and seeing how different outputs into full ladder uh, with, these, uh, with these variables affects like the outputs. And finally, I just have a for loop in there where every second, this is how delays work, every second I'm increasing the counter, then I'm assigning the three bits of the counter to uh, two A and B inputs, and then a carry in, and I'm just ending the module. You have to and uh, remember to end each sort of one of these things. So the initial begin needs an end module. The for loop needs end, and everything else does as well. Uh, something to note here is that this counter I'm incremented using what's called a blocking statement. Uh, this is going to stop it from. Uh, it's going to make it so the uh, the FPGA runs this or the code runs this first, and then it can run all of these in parallel. Because this, these are based off of the counter, so I, you want to make sure that this has this value set, and then these three can just run in parallel. It doesn't really matter which order they're, they're done in. Um, this is the output you get. Uh, these are this initial table thing is from the display statement. If you enter 000, uh, this is a table, uh, a truth table I found online. But if you enter 000, Sum is zero, carry is zero. Uh, if you enter, I don't know, A and B, big most of these one, then there's just going to be a carry out. And if you just make everything one, including the carry in, it's just going to output a sum and a carry out. Pretty, uh, pretty simple example. One thing I also want to mention is sometimes Verilog on the UMBC servers can be a little tricky. Uh, I remember during my, when I took 212, we had issues setting it up so where everyone could run it. This is an online website that just executes Verilog code. Um, I don't know if the Verilog issues are still there, but this should be more than enough for any labs or anything else y'all do. But yeah, and that's about it. Any questions? Now, let me look at chat. Hmm, okay. Avi, I sort of, I thought there were as well, but I like referenced this textbook and a couple of other sites to make sure, but majority of them said that initials shouldn't, can't be synthesized or just shouldn't be. So I kind of just went like with something that I had initially. Oh, and these are the sources I had. Highly recommend with this book. Very good introduction to Verilog and FPGAs.